Good morning. Today is 7 November, the year 2011. I'm Dr. Dave Thompson, a volunteer at the Palm Springs Air Museum here in Palm Springs, California. As part of the Veterans History Project of the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., we conduct interviews of veterans and civilians who participated in our country's military conflicts. Today, I'm here at the museum along with fellow volunteer Mickey Alston, and today we have the honor and the privilege of interviewing Sue Ellie. Sue was a missionary nurse in Vietnam from 1969 to 1971. And her father was a B-17 waist gunner shot down over Europe during World War II and the POW. So we're going to talk to her about her father's experiences and her own experiences. So, so nice to have you here, Sue. Thank you. Okay. Now, let me get you lined up here. And, well, first of all, tell us, what, uh, what's that garment you have on there? This is a jacket from World War II, and it was issued to my father. He thinks it was when he got to Fort Dix after getting off the Liberty ship on his way home, oh, oh, uh, okay. all of his clothing that he had in his trunk at the base was gone. Oh, uh, yeah. So, Let me see your left shoulder there. I want to see that's the 8th Air Force patch. Yeah. I know. Okay, that looks great. And this is funny. This is not his bombardment group. His bombardment group was a 384th. This is a 399th, which was a training group. Oh, but maybe they had extra patches yeah. to... And what's that around your neck there? And this is a dog tag from mm -hmm. my dad. Yeah. My dad is 91. He's he's living. Yeah. He survived the war and raising three daughters. <laughs> so, Did you say which was worse? <laughs> well, <laughs> the daughter thing lasted a lot longer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Um, great. Okay, that'll get us. Uh, I got to she look all right there, Mickey? She look good there? Okay. Uh, and Mickey, feel free to jump in and ask questions of yourself. Oh, okay. So, okay. Uh, since, uh, okay. Well, let's just, first of all, um, Mickey, you go sit by her just a second. Go, I want you to go sit by her for just a moment. Sit by her for just a moment. And tell me, Mickey, how, how do you know this lady? How do you know Sue? Right after my husband passed away, uh, I was looking for a church in the valley, and I went to almost every church out here, and I finally settled on Palm Springs Baptist Church, which is down on El Cielo. And the pastor there, his name was Dave, he would always, if a single person came in, he would try to pair that person up with somebody. So I, I was there by myself, and one Sunday, Sue came in. She got a day off from nursing, and he sat her over by me. And I'm, I'm an early person. I always try to get there early. So, so then in a couple of weeks, we kind of smiled at each other. We didn't say much of anything that day. And a couple of weeks later, she came back, and Dave sat her by me again. And this time, we smiled a little bit more at each other. <laughs> And we chatted, and uh, we said, well, let's get together and go out to dinner, because her husband was still in Washington State. So we, we made a date and got together, and we went to uh, the Mexican restaurant downtown Palm Springs, Las Casuelas. And as I recall, we had several margaritas. <laughs> and we found out we lived in the same And we found out we lived in the same complex. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, we liked each other, and the conversation flowed really easily. So we would get together every once in a while. And I don't know if we got together and went over to the club before Bart came down or not. Probably. But, but right after her husband came down, then I went out to dinner with them. And our friendship just kind of grew and grew and grew. And I, I, was, I was going through a very difficult time. 
and Sue mentioned one day that she was a volunteer at the Air Museum. And I asked her about it, and we talked more about it, more about it, and she put me in contact with Bill Hughes, and I came down, and at first I thought, mm, Air Museum, I don't know about this. But when I talked to Bill Hughes, and when I saw the volunteers, and everyone was so friendly, and it gave me a purpose. So I was happy that I had oh, volunteered. That's great. Yeah. And I used to admire Sue's stars. At the time I joined her, she had two stars. And I found out <laughs> how you get stars. Oh, oh, yeah. Four. Uh, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and at, at first we were volunteers on the B-17 together oh. for a year and a half or two years. And I met some really nice people on the B-17. And then after a while, uh, I decided that it was time for me to move on. So then I, I met Bob. Bob was real friendly on the uh, on the JOT, the, yeah, on the job chain, OJT. Mm -hmm. So uh, there was another guy that was on the B-17. His name was Bill Burton. And Bill Burton was a volunteer also, and a real good friend of Bill Hughes. So we both talked and we decided we'd go up to the library. So we did. And I was kind of trying to learn the flight simulators and trying to feel my way around. And, and I, I would see Dr. Dave come in every once in a while and he would sneak in with this box of things. And he'd always, he'd always smile at me too, really friendly and really nice. And one day, uh, when I had nothing to do. I, I had typed up a couple of the forms and it was my way of getting Dr. Dave to stop and talk to me, and he did. So he, he looked at the forms and uh, we agreed that he already had them in print. And from that time on, we smiled more at each other. And then um, I went, Bob asked me to go to an event at the museum, the Palm Springs Gala. Gala. And I didn't know a lot of people at that time, but uh, Dr. Dave and his wife, Diane, were sitting at the same table. Mm -hmm. So I was sitting, it was Diane, Dr. Dave, uh, me, and Bob Andrade, and some other people. So we, all of us had several glasses of wine, and we were having a good time. And Dr. Dave introduced himself again, and I met his wife, Diane. And during the course of the evening, he said, you know, I need somebody to help me with the interviews. And he said, you know, we'll we'll get together maybe in a couple of weeks. And he came in and he had this great big box. It was full of folders. And we went in the conference room. And I remember thinking, what have I gotten myself into here? And we went into the conference room, and, and Dr. Dave kept throwing these folders at me, and he kept saying, you know, he'd done this and done that and what have you. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, Vicki, this is going to turn into a full-time job. But uh, I, before we left, I remember I told Dr. Dave, I said, if, I, if this gets too much, I'm just going to push back. And he said, push back. But anyway, that was the beginning of our love affair. <laughs> and uh, we work well together, and uh, I enjoy uh, interacting with the people. And, uh, and then one day, Sue was up here in the library, and Dr. Dave was in the main library. I think he was going through his life magazines. And I introduced him to Sue, and she mentioned her dad. And then I said, and she was also a missionary in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Dr. Dave stepped up to the table and asked her to do an interview, and that's why we're here today. So she's here. Thank right. you, Mickey. Well, it and sounds like you guys are really good friends. I'm so and Sue is so my glad. best friend here in the valley. Sue, thank you for getting her here, and Mickey, thank you for getting her I think here. I think we should get another <laughs> star, just for I, I would Mickey. think so. Thank I would, <laughs> I would yeah, think so. Yeah. For putting okay, up with Sue. Mickey, you get another star. <laughs> <laughs> get out of the way. <laughs> okay. Now, so, well, yes. um, I'm assuming you joined the museum because of your dad. Yes. You had an interest in the B-17. Yes. And I looked like at the B-17 for about five minutes and yeah. said, hey, do you need volunteers here? So, well, we'll get into that later, but as long as we're talking about this, when did you first come here to Palm Springs? 
2005. Okay, and then how soon after that did you join the museum? I think it was later that year. Uh, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So you, came, you knew the museum was here, you came over, looked at it, and mm -hmm. saw the B-17, and then, okay. Yes. All right, well, let's go back to your dad now. All right. Uh, can you uh, pronounce and spell his full name for us, please? Uh, Philip William Chaperone, and the last name is C-H-A-P-E-R-O-N. Okay, and when and where was he born? He was born September 9th, 1920 in Portland, Oregon. Making him how many so years he's 91. young? 91. The guy that I just interviewed yesterday was 91. <laughs> um, and uh, okay, so in Portland, Oregon, and um, uh, what did your dad do? He was a carpenter mm -hmm. all of his life. Okay, oh, oh, let, me, uh, let me back. Let your grandfather, his father, what did his father do? Since we're taught right now, you're kind of stepping in for him, so. Okay. What did, what did his father do, well, as you recall? his father was, uh, I'm not sure exactly what he did, but during World War I, he spoke fluent French. And he was in the American Army, stationed in France, working as an interpreter. Mm -hmm. And he met this little hotel maid and married her. On their wedding day, the mayor of the little town came up and waved the French flag in her face and called her a deserter. <laughs> so she was a World War I bride, came to America, had always had a heavy French accent. <laughs> and what was her name and her maiden name? Uh, Jeanette Nadal was her maiden name. So N-A-D-A-L. Mm -hmm. And her... Uh, her husband's family had money, so I'm not sure exactly what he did to make more money, if he did anything. But he deserted the family when my dad was 12. Oh, okay. So my dad was raised by his, his mom mm -hmm. and then his German grandmother and had a sister. So the poor man was surrounded by women. And, uh, and he had did, three daughters. <laughs> did your dad uh, speak French? No. no. Okay, so, you know, no. You, do you remember your grandmother? Yes. Did she speak French or no. did yes. she, she had a heavy accent? Heavy so. accent, yes. Yeah. Okay. So. And did, um, and did and you? He, so he was estranged from his dad. Yeah. His dad moved to San Francisco. Okay. And did your dad have brothers and sisters? Yes, one sister. And what's Mary her name? Marianne. Marianne. And is she still alive? Yes. And where does she live? She lives in the Portland, Oregon area. Okay. Um, and um, your dad, was their family very religious? Did they go to church a lot and stuff? Yes. Um, interestingly, my French grandmother was Catholic in France, but she became a Christian, just Protestant Christian here. Mm -hmm. And was very faithful mm -hmm. at church. Very faithful. Okay. Do you know what church they went to? Um, they went to a, a community church in my dad's neighborhood. Okay. And um, did your dad ever talk about growing up when he was a kid? Did he have lots of? Did they? What they did? Because your dad grew up during the depression. I'm sure. So did he talk about yes. what that was like? Um, a a little bit. Portland was not as populated, and he talks about riding his bike around for miles and miles and miles, mm -hmm. and a man in his neighborhood had a horse in his yard, um, and he had a very good friend, lifelong friend, whose dad owned grandma's cookies, and he'd get to go to the cookie factory oh. with his friend <laughs> and yeah. eat the rejects. <laughs> So he he had a uh, he had a good childhood. His his mom was an excellent cook, good housekeeper. She had to work outside the home, yeah. but did he talk about having odd jobs when he was a kid? Um, I don't remember so much. Yeah. Do you remember the grammar school that he went to? No. Or the high school? He went to Benson High School, and it was an all-boys 
high school at that time. Was it a public high school? Or yes. Yes. Did he play any sports that you know of? Mm -hmm. you talk about? No. Okay. Uh, I think he did have part-time jobs, but he, it was a trade school, oh. so I think he learned about carpentry mm -hmm. at that school. Okay. Um, <coughs> so he would have graduated in from 30, 1939, I guess. Probably. Um, and did he? Do you know what he did after he, he got out of high school? Well, he was working in a in a factory um, that melted steel. What do you call that? A foundry. Foundry. Yeah. He was working in a foundry, and since he was the only male in his family, he did not enlist. So when when people tell my dad, "Thank you for your service," he says. Don't thank me. <laughs> I was drafted. <laughs> <laughs> Does he? Uh, did he ever talk about December seventh? What he was doing and what he thought, or anything like that? No, no. I, I can't remember. Okay. So he was drafted and uh, into the army, I assume. Yes. And did, how did he get it, end up in the Air Corps? Do you know? Mm, I think he showed interest in it yeah. and volunteered for it. Had he had any interest in aviation when he was a kid? Did he ever no. talk anything about that? Okay. No. And so where did he go for his basic training? Um, the first three weeks was at Fort Lewis, and I'm looking to my notes that I've go right ahead. gathered from yeah. talking to my dad. Yeah. Fort Lewis, Washington. Okay. And there's where they were sorted out for what kind of assignment they wanted. So he volunteered for the paratroopers, <laughs> but he joined the Ar Army Air Corps because they needed <laughs> recruits. Yeah. <laughs> and then he started his basic training at Shepherd Field in Texas. Um, then went to Aerial Gunnery School in Las Vegas. Yeah. Then he went to Armament School in Denver. By the way, one of our, uh, if you haven't already seen, <coughs> one of our Life magazines shows a gunner at that school in Las Vegas. Has a oh. t-shirt on with Las Vegas on it. Oh. I'll show it to you when mm. we get done. Remind me. I'm making you remind me. And he married my mom in January 28, 1943, when he was in uh, armament school in Denver. And they, they came on the train from Portland to Denver. They were married and had a dinner at the Brown Derby in Denver. <laughs> and what, what was uh, your mom's n name, her maiden name? Anne Patricia Westfall. And how long, well, how did they meet, or how did they know each other? They met through my my mom's brother. Uh, they were in the same social circles, okay. apparently. And what did her dad do? Uh, he was in the lumber industry, and then he he died, and she had a stepdad. Maybe he was in the lumber industry, mm -hmm. but um. And 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 my my mom's mom was my hero. She was a nurse. Her name was Zena. And when she was a very young woman, she left home and went into nurses training in in Eastern Oregon. She was a feisty person, and she ended up having a little hospital in in Portland. And then she was in the nursing home. Business. Was she born in France? No, no this was no, my mom's was, yeah, mom. My mother's. Okay. Yeah, and she was born in Eastern Oregon. And um, <coughs> during the war, when your dad was overseas and whatnot, um, well, <laughs> and in a prison camp and being shot down, yeah. well, well, what was she doing in, in the States when he was overseas? She was living with her mother, mm -hmm. Zena, and this is kind of interesting. Um, the, by the way, the wedding was in a congregational church, and that's where my dad, he grew up in a congregational church. Um, but they just, the family just came in for the wedding, and then they got on the train and went right back to yeah. Oregon. Yeah. Um, and I, I'll just go through this training because there's something interesting coming up with their marriage. Okay. So he was training to be a B-17 uh, crew member. And 
<clears throat> the first phase of that training was in Boise, Idaho, and he and his crew accidentally dropped sandbags on Mountain Home, which is a nearby community. Oh. <laughs> Bombs away yeah. in Mountain Home. <laughs> these were young guys on these oh, planes. Oh, absolutely. And they practiced bombing at night mm. <laughs> in Paul <laughs> Irwin, Idaho. And then phase two of the training was in Walla Walla, Washington. And the third phase of crew training was in Madras, Oregon. And there, the range still exists. There's a Boardman range. Mm. I'd like to know who volunteers to drive the plane that tows the target <laughs> for the 18-year-olds to be shooting their machine guns at. <laughs> but that's what they did on the Boardman Range. Yeah. And they also did submarine patrol up and down the Oregon coast, Washington mm -hmm. coast, to have more time, Dad says stick time, in the plane. Uh, <laughs> then <clears throat> they went to Kearney, Nebraska, and in Grand Island, Nebraska, they were assigned to a plane and had all new equipment. And the Sperry bomb site was involved, uh, installed by the Navy and tested in Rome, New York. By that time, my dad had trained as a waste gunner, radio operator, and ball turret gunner. But they, he was always on the left waist. He never was in another position. That's kind of interesting. Yeah. That they trained them for other jobs. Yeah. Uh, well, I think I think it's kind of like we do cross training here. If, if the ball turret gunner gets hurt or something, and you need need somebody yeah. down there, you could. Yeah. Look. Then, he was in Manchester, New Hampshire, waiting to be deployed, and my mother Anne came out to visit, and stayed with for eight days with him. And that's well, when she became pregnant with my older sister. <laughs> <laughs> and what year was that? In 1943. Okay. And did, what, did he go in in 42? Is that when he Either got late 42 or early 43. Yeah. I have a feeling it was late 42. Yeah. Okay. Because <clears throat> that's a lot of training that they went through. That took months. And oh. So he was a staff sergeant and... They were waiting to join the up with the 8th Air Force in England. And the journey began, the 12 B-17s left at the same time, flew to Bangor, Maine, then Newfoundland, then Presswick, Scotland, then England. And I'm sure that was a familiar northern route it, it, to it, get it, to yeah, Europe. Yeah, most, most of them went that way, yeah. And he trained as a toggleer when he got to his airfield in Grafton Underwood. It's on our map of the little airfields oh, okay. in uh, England. Mm -hmm. uh, but he never, he never worked as a toggle there. So. And that uh, bomb group was the the three eighty fourth. Okay. Yeah. And um, does he talk at all about his first mission, or what it was like, or what he felt? Yes, it's kind of interesting. Here he was on the first mission with that crew that had done all that training together. And he was at the open window of the left waist position and he got very severe frostbite. He said he got it on his face, his chin, and his neck. Uh, yeah, they don't have that plexiglass that we have in, no. in our side. And if you, look at the, open. if you look at pictures of the equipment, they do have a hat that meets the goggles, and then they have the oxygen mask, and they had scarves. Just somebody tell me when turtlenecks were invented, because they didn't have them in World War II. Too yeah. bad. Yeah. So he got such severe frostbite on that first mission that he was in the hospital, and he was out for two weeks. While he was out, that crew was shot down. He remained lifelong friends with the pilot from the crew that he trained with. 
the, the they survived then, the guys who got shot down, were they POWs or did they get back? They were POWs. Yeah, okay. And I don't know, there were probably casualties too, yeah. I'm not too sure. Yeah. But I asked my dad, so how did you keep from getting frostbite on your other 20 missions? And he said, I learned not to hang my head out the window. <laughs> <laughs> but here's my theory on that, that it was his first mission, he was a rookie, he was too vigilant, and he leaned into that stream yeah, exactly. of around. minus 60 degree temperature. Yeah. And I think with more experience, you checked your equipment maybe a little better and you stood back. Yeah. So, <laughs> and he d he's, he's a lucky man. He doesn't have problems. Well, he lives in Portland, Oregon. It's not cold that much, but he hasn't had recurring problems with his skin on his yeah. face. Um, so did they? So he got in with another crew then. Short, so yes, he flew with different crews. Um, now um, I saw. I think you had on your thing the name of one of the planes, I believe. Yeah, Dame, Damn Yankee Two was the plane that he was shot down. Okay. Uh, tell me uh, if you know. You said on his twenty-first mission, I believe he got shot down. Did he talk any any of these other missions? Uh, Yes, he, one of his bombing missions was to Norway. Heavy water? To bomb the mines that were producing heavy water. Yeah. I believe it was only one mission. His longest mission was to Marienburg, Poland. And they sacrificed room in the bomb bay to carry more fuel and fewer bombs. Mm -hmm. um, he had I found out about his experience after volunteering here because I had specific question and specific knowledge about the B-17. He had a water landing in the English Channel and they were picked up quickly by the Air Sea Rescue. Mm -hmm. So when I give a tour, I, the window in the radio, radio room, I say this is where the crew can escape if they're having a water so landing. So that's how they went out. Yeah. <clears throat> and, and also I th there's a life raft that pops up yeah. above the Bombay, I believe, somewhere on the top of the plane. He also had a wheels up landing on a muddy field in England and they purposely flooded these fields so they'd be slippery. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if they were able to drop the ball turret or if the ball turret just came up and destroyed the plane. There was a lot of mud, my dad said, that came up into the bomb bay and mm -hmm. just went throughout the plane. Mm -hmm. But it was a it was a good landing yeah, in that sure. the crew survived. Yeah. Any landing you walk away from is good. Yeah. yeah. And he also was telling me that if they didn't drop the bombs on the primary or secondary targets, they dropped them in the English Channel on the way home. And then that did not count as a mission. I don't know how many of those that he had. Yeah. Uh, his first Purple Heart was by friendly fire from a B-17 in his, in his flight mm -hmm. group. They had to test their machine guns over the English Channel. So during that test, his plane was shot <laughs> by, <laughs> by a B-17 in his squadron. So, uh, it didn't stop the mission though. I asked, how bad was it? And I imagine. Where did he get hit, did he say? In his leg. And, and the second Purple Heart was during the shot, being shot down. Okay. Um, did he talk about, did they get a lot of uh, enemy planes that they had to deal with? I know they had to deal with flak. The flak, um, he talked about standing on their flak vests. Mm -hmm. They weren't really vests, they were like tunics. Mm -hmm. I don't know, the yeah. correct term the for them. Metal in them or something. To yeah. Put them, yeah. Um, <laughs> I remember one of, one of the first guys was the B-17 pilot, and he was 
and he was on a mission, and he was having a hard time controlling the plane. You know, it was real sluggish and stuff, and he got back, and these guys had all these vests piled up in, in the back of the plane, you know, and he said, get those out of there, you can't take all that stuff with us. <laughs> <laughs> There's an interesting story that came about when my dad was shot down. He had been on a leave, and one of his crew members' name was Joe. Joe was the tail gunner. They were in Wales in a hotel for R&R. &R. And the people at the hotel said, you know, we've got a big group coming in. And would you mind leaving a day early. You could go to London and then back to your base. My dad said, sure, no problem. So they thought they'd go to London. And then my dad thought better of it. You know, I've already been to London. Let's just go back to the base. So the next day they got assigned to the mission. Now, my dad and Joe survived and were prisoners of war in the same camp. And Joe did not speak to my dad for the whole 13 months, because he, he blamed being shot down on my father. <laughs> <laughs> so they weren't buddies after the war. <laughs> Did he talk about uh, any going into London at all? And when he hit, like the buzz bombs or anything like that? No. What he did? Or, yeah. No. Okay. Um, well, let's talk about that final mission then. And um, unless you got something else there you would, would like to no. Okay. So they and what was that? What day was that again? Um, April fourteenth, nineteen forty-four. And I believe you said they were going to Schweinfurt. Yes, and there he was in a group with twenty-three other B-17s that took off at nine forty-one. They were the high group of the forty-first combat wing. And this group became the first bomb division's 172 aircraft. I, I'm always blown away by the number of B-17s that would go yeah, on one mission. Sometimes a thousand later on. Yeah. Just incredible. And their mission was the ball bearing manufacturing plant in Schweinfurt, Germany. Mm -hmm. Heavily fortified. And it was the the German uh, fighter pilots that just destroyed his plane. I asked him, did you bail out by going out the back door? And he said, you didn't need a door. The plane was just shot up, so you just fell into the sky. Yeah. And at that, at the bombing altitude, you're very likely to lose consciousness, which he did. Plus he was had a shrapnel wound in his arm. 20,000 feet or yeah. more. And his jaw was broken. So he was in and out of consciousness. <coughs> he was, uh, did he get his sustained his injuries when he hit the ground or going out or do you know? Uh, the shrapnel was going down. No, the, no, I mean air. his injuries, his, he, you say he had a broken the, jaw. Yeah. Uh, did that happen, do you, do you know? I don't know. Don't, okay. He landed on a barn roof Oh. Well. and it probably wasn't pretty. <laughs> His that body was on one side of the roof and his shoe was on the other. He was hanging? Yes. Oh. Luckily, there were off-duty German soldiers nearby. And they intervened and cut him down. And, and probably protected him from the civilians who might yes. have been irate. Yeah. Um, one thing, if I could back up just a little bit. My dad told me that before a mission, you got real eggs for breakfast and pancakes, no coffee. Mm -hmm. <laughs> For <obvious> reasons. <laughs> you, wanted, you didn't want yeah. to have those kind of needs yeah. because there were no bathrooms. And the relief tubes did not function at bombing altitude. <laughs> Way too cold. Froze, froze up. <laughs> and they were given a candy bar, a pack of gum, and an orange. He said the orange always froze. The candy bar, they could keep in an inside pocket, and the gum was really good for uh, keeping their ears mm -hmm. clear. Um, 
But after he was shot down, then he was taken to, uh, and his plane was Damn Yankee 2. And, I'm sorry, what? The name of his plane was Damn Yankee 2. You're right. Um, and you said it was near Heidelberg where he went down? Yes, Heppenheim, over Heppenheim. And I, I don't really know where Heppenheim is in relation to Sch Schweinfurt. I don't know. Uh, s but near Heidelberg. He was taken by the German soldiers to uh, D U L A G Luft. Um, Luft. Yeah. I don't, I'm not sure. Stala, oh, well, yeah, I'm doing, yeah, it's a little different than a Stala Luft, I guess. And it was in Frankfurt. Okay. And he was interrogated for seven days. Uh, he only told his name, rank, and serial number. And then at the end of the seven days, the Germans pulled out his file. They knew everything anyway. They knew everything. Yeah. They knew about his his uh, early life, what high school he went to, his military training, the crew members' names. <laughs> and he said the Germans knew who shaved that morning before the mission. Wow. And it was very demoralizing, and that was the point huh. of it. And after the interrogation, he was put in a 40 by 8 boxcar. Yeah. And 40 by 8 is the name of some... Well, it's a 40 and 8. 40 it, it, and would eight. it could carry uh, 40 men and 8 horses. He went back to World War I. Okay. So it, was so it wasn't the measurements. No. It wasn't really... No, 40 and 8. 40 feet long would be really... No, 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 no. It had nothing to do with that. It was... Okay. It was I should revise my... Forty men. And I, eight it, horses. I I wrote forty by eight boxcar, but I actually didn't know what that meant. It, so. It's not forty by forty and eight. Forty and eight. Okay. And he went through a lot of Germany into Krems, Austria. And I I think all the time how lucky he was to have arrived. Because we were blowing up their trains. Oh yes, we were. That was part of the strategic bombing. Sure. Uh, and it was really slow. They'd have to pull off on other side tracks. Well, German supplies went by and troops, so it was a, not a good. Was Joe trip. the only other guy that was with with him at the time? From the as far as I know, yes. And the name of his camp was Stalag Seventeen B. Yeah, I looked it up on the computer just a while ago. So he was there for 13 months. He was, oh, I have to back up a little bit. When the German soldiers captured him, they took him to a, an Italian dentist. I don't know whether this was a prisoner or, I imagine it probably was. I don't know what that situation was. But the dentist drilled, because my dad had the broken jaw. He drilled a hole in his tooth to string wire, and then he couldn't find wire to fit in it. Oh. And I'm thinking, that was probably horrendous. <laughs> yeah. And then when he got to the... The Italians were uh, allied with the Germans, so... That's true. So he was... Okay, that's true. Um, When he got to prison camp, he was back and forth to a hospital nearby. He was sick a lot, and a U.S. Army doctor found piano wire mm -hmm. and wired my dad's jaw shut and probably drilled more. Mm -hmm. um, he said he carried things back and forth from the hospital to the camp, like wire. They, were, they built radios. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you build a radio out of wire, but they did, so they could learn. Yeah. Was he, he was mistreated? No, but he was just sick a lot and lost a lot of weight. And he won't eat a parsnip to this day. 
the Red Cross uh, allowed families at home to send packages, right. but they, the Germans at, stored them, didn't really distribute them like they mm -hmm. were supposed to. Well, they were short on food <coughs> themselves, probably. In, in yeah. Um, speaking about that, does your mom say when she first found out about this and stuff? She found that he was missing in action. That was the first telegram from the War Department. Um, and she was pregnant. And then got the next telegram that he was a prisoner of war. And she was actually able to um, communicate with him through the Red Cross. Mm. So she sent letters and stuff. Yeah. And somehow, somehow, he was able to send her flowers. I don't know how he did that. Maybe he arranged it with his family mm -hmm. by a letter. And I do remember. You, do you have any of those letters? Uh, I don't personally. My dad yeah. has them. Well, we got it's copies. Right. It'd be nice to put in. Yeah. Fine. Okay. Um, at some point when I was a little girl, my dad sent my mom red roses for her birthday or anniversary or something, and she just burst into tears because he had arranged that while he was a prisoner of war. So that had a real big emotional impact mm -hmm. on her. Um, they were always digging tunnels, and the Germans always knew about it. So they let the prisoners dig tunnels to a certain point, then they'd shut it down. And the movie, Stalag 17B, was about spying inside the camp. It had nothing to do with my dad's yeah. actual mm -hmm. camp. It yeah, could have been any camp. There was an infiltrator in there, yeah. given all the information to the Germans. But they were there. They really were there. I'm sure they were, yeah. And there were some suicides. A prisoner would cross a certain line near the perimeter, and if you did that, you were shot by the guard in the tower. When you say suicide, do you think they did it on purpose just so they would get shot? Yeah. Or, or I don't know, trying to think they could escape somehow. Yeah. But Well, I think sometimes they just <coughs> lose it, you know, yes. and can't stand it anymore. And don't know what they're doing, probably. And, and his camp was divided by nationality. So you had the Brits, the Americans, and yeah. the Russians. And he said the, the Russians were a real rough group. And the Germans had dogs, and they'd send the dogs in to wake the prisoners up. And one morning when they sent the dogs into the Russian barracks, the dogs didn't come out. <laughs> Kept them, made them. <laughs> I'm sure they did. <laughs> yeah. Um, and they could volunteer for. My dad said it was a military labor camp. Oh, they also had French prisoners, Czechoslovakian. Uh, they they could volunteer to do farm work. So was it winter time when your dad was in the POW camp? He he endured a winter. Well, he went down through in April, April. but he was in thirteen months. So yeah. yeah, he would have gone through gone a whole year. So he would yeah. Have, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, um, I think, um, they treated the airmen a little better than they did the yes. other prisoners, yes. and they didn't make them work. Yeah. But a lot of guys said. They wanted to work anyway, give them something to do, you know, instead yeah. of sitting around all the time. And maybe you could eat. And sometimes they would even pay you a little bit, I think. Yeah. And you might eat better. Eat better, yeah. They, they, because you were working, they'd give you more food, cause, so you would, could, could do more work. They, in, in 1945, they could hear the Russian guns coming from Vienna. Germans when they get away from that. And the Germans heard it too. So they cleared the camp out. And I believe there were probably 4,000 prisoners. 
and march them up into Germany so they could surrender to the Allied forces. Right. And when, when my dad... And that was, now that was, I mean, I've talked to other guys that yeah. did that too, and that was yes. in the winter time, pretty much. I mean, it was February, January, February, March, in that range. And so they, that was tough, marching in the snow and stuff. I don't know if he talked about that. Well, he doesn't remember exactly how long it took. He thinks it took about a week, but it was camping out. It was, yeah. and not much food. It wasn't good. And they met up with the Seventh Army in Germany, and the Seventh Army Army did not have any resources to help them. So they met up with the Third Army, Patton's, Third. Patton's Army, mm -hmm. and he was able to uh, get flights, get them to Lahar to Camp Lucky Strike. <laughs> Have you heard that before? Uh huh. There's two camps. One was Lucky Strike, and the other was Chesterfield. <laughs> so, so the ex-POWs were at this camp. They weren't ready for a, a, a voyage across the sea. They were underweight. They hadn't been able to eat properly, so their digestion was not good. So they kept them at this camp until they could eat, and they could eat anything at any time that they wanted to. So there was an adjustment of, of eventually keeping food down, and my dad made friends with somebody who um, drove a supply boat, ferrying supplies to different ships in the harbor, and. He said, do you want the best breakfast? The Navy makes the best breakfast. <laughs> so my dad was able to go and, and be on a, a ship. And it sounds like somebody took care of him a little bit. Then, then he was put on a Liberty ship and sent to Fort Dix. I don't know how long he was in Fort Dix. But then he went by train back to Portland. Did your dad have any health issues as a result of the POW, other you know, than his broken jaw? That's a good question. He is very well treated by the VA. His VA card is a different color because he was a POW. Mm -hmm. um, he has, they think it was due to starvation conditions. He has no feeling from the knees down. Yeah. And he's not diabetic, but it's peripheral neuropathy that many diabetics get. And my dad's is pretty severe. And that's that's what they figure triggered it. So. so when he got home, he had a child waiting for him. Yes. And my older sister was apparently a real colicky baby. <laughs> she cried a lot. <laughs> what a shock. You know, you come home and you have this little baby. Mm -hmm. And what was her name? Uh, Patricia. And how many children uh, did you did they have? Your mom did three, three girls. So I was born in June of '46. So that was after about a year after he got home, and then my other sister was born in '48. And what's her name? Linda. So what did your dad do when he, after he came home? Then? He, he really went right to work being a carpenter. And he, I think that was, work was his therapy as for so many of the World War II vets. He worked six days a week all the time until into his 70s. Looking back, he says, that's a reg regret that I have, because I could have been with my family more. Mm -hmm. But that maybe was the best thing for him. Yeah, that was the way he coped. He's not much of a talker. Mm -hmm. And uh, did he have his own business, or did he work for no, uh, somebody? Or he what? worked for somebody. He worked for them for decades. Go in like in a factory, or going out to houses? No, he was a he was a kind of an all-around carpenter. He did really nice finish work and remodeling, 
but he was part of a crew that built bridges. Mm. He was in a lumber camp in Washington, building something for the camp. Uh, it was a variety of things, but towards the end, it was being a Finnish carpenter. Where did your mom and dad first live when he came home? Lived in Portland, Oregon. Do you remember the street they lived on? Mm, no, it was in East, I think it was on 75th, near Foster Road. Uh, I have pictures of all those homes. Yeah. My dad and mom and I made a, a tour around town <laughs> oh, with my so camera. They, they lived in different yes. places. Yes. But where, where, uh, where do you remember the most where you lived? Or, well, let's, let's go into you, you're now. You're about, um, well, let's, yeah. So you were born in 46, did you say? Yes, June of 46. And so uh, tell me a little bit about uh, what it was like growing up in Portland, and where were some of the places you lived, or where, where, where do you remember the most? Um, what I remember the most is um, 35th and Hawthorne, and we have old movies oh. that have really helped the memories. My mom sewed cute little taffeta dresses that, that we had at Christmas. Was All it a stuff. single story or a two story? Two house? story. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And then we were in a rental house for a time and uh, ended up, when I was about five years old, we moved to the home where my father lives now. Mm -hmm. And it's on 42nd Stark Street. What's the address? 4271 Southeast Stark. And was that a two story also? Or yes, two story. And after my dad added on, it has five bedrooms, mm. which end up being storage for things my dad is buying. <laughs> he doesn't so like you to get had rid your own things. bedroom most of the time then? In high school. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that was when the project was finished. Yeah. <laughs> and we had, I remember he had a 57 Chevy. That was <laughs> of the most interesting car. Big fins. Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> black and white. Mm -hmm. He did take time off. We did have some camping trips. That was our vacation time. He bought this boat when I was in high school, and it was a 12-foot boat, and it had a 25-horsepower motor. No, I think it was a 12-horsepower motor. <laughs> Not very fast. And he bought uh, water skis. <laughs> so the, his girls could water ski. <laughs> and there was this little lake near where my grandmother lived on the coast. She lived in Rockaway, Oregon, my French grandmother. Took it to the lake, and it's a good thing we were little and didn't weigh very much, because 12 horses is not going to get you out of the water very easily. And I guess we were pretty strong, because we could hold on to that rope for a long time, <laughs> up out of the water. And I remembered I didn't want to do it. Somehow I was very afraid, but Dad was very insistent, and I was adventuresome at heart, I guess, so. I think we all got to water ski by some miracle in this <laughs> little lake. <laughs> so we have, we have good, good childhood memories. My mom was a, a wonderful cook. A great hostess. And Your neighborhood, was it kind of a mixture or was it an ethnic neighborhood or anything like that? What was like? Not very ethnic. Uh, we were near a beautiful park, Laurelhurst Park. Mm -hmm. And those were the days when you could uh, take your little lunch, say goodbye to mom, mm -hmm. and be at the park all day. Yeah. And Mrs. Snow, the craft lady, would help you paint little little uh, ceramic things and uh, those days are gone but it was it was great the park was great and uh, all the neighbor kids were down there in the summer. Where did you go to church? We went to a congregational church and then ended up at Mount Tabor Presbyterian Church when I was about a sixth grader because they had a great youth program. So mom and dad followed along and that was our church home for decades. 
And my mom and dad volunteered for 10 years leading the high school youth group, even after their kids, their girls, were not in high school anymore. Is your mother still alive? No, she's not. When did she pass away? Uh, 2002. Um, and where did you go to grammar school? I went to Glencoe grade school. How far was that from your house? It was only about six blocks. So, so you could walk to we school. walked to school. Yeah. And then Do you I remember went, any of your favorite teachers? Oh, yes. I was the teacher's pet when I was in eighth grade. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Drew. <laughs> she was had sung in the San Francisco Opera Company. And she encouraged me to do artistic things. And she also, I, I got interested in biology. And I had a microscope. And I had a little setup in the basement <laughs> with my microscope <laughs> and my little tools. And I cut things up. And mm -hmm. my mom pricked her finger so I could look at. Her blood underneath a microscope. <laughs> There's a mother's sacrifice. Yeah. <laughs> and I'd send away for frogs and worms and <laughs> dissect things. Yeah. Is that I'd where spend, you got your aptitude for fixing things around the house? It from? Maybe so. <laughs> but I spent hours doing that. Mm. And I was also painting. I always had a craft that I was doing. How'd you get along with your sisters? Really pretty well. My older sister was kind of a bully. And so my younger sister and I paired up more often. And as adults, we are the best of friends. You see the case. Yeah. And uh, so where'd you go to high school? You went for, right from grade school to high school? Yes. Yeah. Uh, went to Washington High School, which has since closed. Uh, there were about 400 in my class, so it wasn't a big school. Building built in 1926, sort of an antique. <laughs> mm -hmm. And some people might find this kind of interesting. When I was a senior, I was uh, voted by my school to be the Rose Festival Princess for that year. Portland, Oregon has an annual Rose Festival in June. Each high school, there were 12 of us then, each high school chose a princess. We had, they've changed it so much, but this was 64. <laughs> we had formal gowns, we had changes of outfits given by Jansen and Pendleton. We drove around town. Yeah, did a swimsuit too? No. Oh, well no, you no. said Jansen. No, it was a, it was a <laughs> suit. Oh, okay, <laughs> not swimsuit. No. Yeah, okay. We drove around town in uh, white Buick convertibles with our names on the sides. And there were two princesses per convertible. The boys' high school provided the drivers. And then a Rosarian, which is their civic group, would go in each car. And we had a coronation night. And each of us had to give a speech about two minutes long. And it better be just exactly two minutes, because it was in the Memorial Coliseum on a circular stage that rotated. So you were escorted up the stairs, you walked down a very long runway to the circular stage, and you had to face the right way, started your speech, and the, the stage rotated, the circle rotated. And in two minutes, you would be facing the same way, <laughs> if you did it right. And we drew straws for who was going, for the order, and I was number one. Oh. It was nice to get it out of the way. But there were 12,000 people there. At that time, it was huge. Now, a princess, mm. not so much. They changed the name to ambassadors. Do you remember the color of your dress? It was pink. Yeah, photographs? Oh, yeah. Oh, we, we need to get those. Uh, I have a whole, <laughs> are you kidding? Yeah, and at that time, the newspapers covered what the princesses did, and I had a little fan club. It was cute. Oh, okay. But now it's not very popular. Did you have a boyfriend in high school? No, not until my senior year. Well, your senior year, who was that? John Hart. He was a baseball player and a basketball player. We had a Cinderella basketball team my senior year. There were only nine guys 
I think we pulled somebody from the JV team just to fill out the bench. There were really five players, maybe six, seven, that actually mm -hmm. played. And we went to state. Oh. And John missed a free throw. <laughs> <laughs> and we didn't win that game, but we played. Our first game was with the champ, the state champs, South Eugene. Ooh, they were a powerhouse. And we didn't have a voice left at the end of that. It were you a, a cheerleader? I was a cheerleader for football. Uh -huh. And our football team was not very good. What was your colors? Maroon and gold. Maroon and gold. Right? Yeah, and the foot fall cheerleaders got wet. <laughs> it <laughs> rained. So. <laughs> <laughs> this was Oregon. <laughs> and, it uh, rained. What, what, what was your name of your team? The, the Colonials, the Washington well, Colonials. The Washington Colonials. I loved to go to my reunions. Yeah. I really enjoyed high school. I was very active and busy. And you had them like every five years or so? Yeah. Yeah, you needed to then come back in Indiana. My yeah. wife, Diane, she graduated from Palm Springs High oh. in 1960. Oh. And they just had their 50th reunion last year and we went. And she, she was one of the organizers of it, so. Was it a good event? Oh, it was really good. They yeah. had it over at the, um, uh, O'Donnell Golf Course. Nice. Uh, that was really nice. Yeah. So that was that was real special. I took, I made a DVD, like we do here, you know, Very and nice. I put a oh. picture of each of the class, her classmates. They oh. did actually sixty and sixty one on the DVD. It was about thirty minutes, and I put fifties music and sixties music in nice. on, at, and with a lot of pictures out of their yearbooks, you know, and I found some. Um, uh, video th uh, tape uh, of uh, that was shot in the 50s here in Palm Springs of what it was like and all the different places and oh, the parade nice. the, the Palm Springs uh, pom she was a pom pom girl and the old the pom pom girls like this was like around 1955 yeah. and stuff like that that was really fun yeah so those oh. things are always nice didn't everyone get a copy of the they did we gave one to everybody wow. uh, that was part of their, their entry fee to come to the thing. How so special we is that? Away. Yeah. Lucky to yeah, have you as a spouse. <laughs> 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 and um, did you have a, a special classes you liked or teachers in high school that you recall? I had an English teacher. Her name was Mrs. Burkham. And we were reading A Tale of Two Cities. And she started out, every, everybody got a book, and she started reading. And then she gathered up the books, and as kind of a teaser. Of course, we eventually got the books yeah. to read it, but she got us very interested. Mm -hmm. And she was the advisor for the rally squad. Um, so I was in her home because we had meetings off campus, and she was a good person, a good teacher. I had a speech teacher who was also very dedicated. Mrs. McRae, mm -hmm. um, and I, I worked in the counselor's office on my lunch hour. That was, that was nice. I enjoyed that, and I was in almost every activity imaginable. Did you drive? Did you have a car? No. Do you, your well, you had the the fifty seven. Yeah, and we had Chevy. we took the bus. We, well, we got a ride with a neighbor on his way to work, to school, but on the way home we took the bus. Did you ever get to City drive bus. your car, or do you remember, what, or did you have a driver's license? Do you remember the first car you drove or anything? Ye yes, we, we sold the Chevy and we had a, a Pontiac, a blue Pontiac, and I remember on one of my first outings I took it to a mall, but I didn't turn the corner very well, <laughs> and I scraped a post. <laughs> <laughs> but this is a this is cute. My first car, I was a junior in college, and I, I went to school locally. I went to Portland State for a year, and then University of Oregon School of Nursing, and it's right in Portland. Okay. It's called or Oregon Health Sciences University now. And I needed a car for public health, so I, I got an Opal Cadet, and it cost one thousand eight hundred dollars. 
and they were sold by the Buick people at that time, I think. Yeah, and it was red. Mm. Uh, quite an unsafe vehicle. It <laughs> was very lightweight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it had a standard transmission. Um, and the first time I drove it independently, I, went, I was working as a nurse's aide in the summer. I got it the summer before my senior year in college. So I drove it and parked it in the employee parking lot. And what I did not know was when it was time for me to go home, I was working the, the evening shift, so I got off at 11.30. My dad came to watch me and make sure I got home. And I didn't see him. He was in the, his own vehicle, parked away from mine. And I was so excited about this red Opal Cadet. <laughs> and I got in, and I, my driving skills weren't too good, you know, kind of lurchy. <laughs> and my dad was following me. <laughs> and I, so I pulled into by the house, and then my dad pulled in. Gee, where you been, Dad? <laughs> I've been right behind you, watching. <laughs> and it was so cute, because his concern for me, mm -hmm. and then my total, being totally oblivious to anything but that little car. Did you and your sisters ever go to the same school together? Yes. You did? We overlapped because we were two years apart. So when I was a freshman, my older sister was a junior, and then the same for my younger sister. So you were like stair steps. Yeah. And my older sister was a Rose Festival princess in her year. And then my younger sister, it was, it was nasty. When she was a senior and would, have, would be in the running, we were getting nasty calls at home. It was a sad experience. But you mean uh, like pornographic kind of stuff, or no, just mean? Just mean. Oh. Like you think you're going to be the princess oh. this year. So. When do you, uh, when did you decide you wanted to go into nursing? When I was in the sixth grade, I had my spleen removed. We have a, a hereditary anemia. And having your spleen removed takes care of any kind of problems you're going to have. So at that time, uh, the nurses, w the nursing students wore starched aprons over their uniforms. And they'd swish into the room, swish out. And I thought, mm -hmm. oh, being a nurse, that looks good. And see, that, that then cemented my interest in biology. And my grandmother had been a nurse. And yeah. she, she told me, at that time, there were different, basically two different programs. And one was the diploma program where you went for three calendar years, you were involved with a hospital staff, you got a lot of experience. And then the other was a degree program, four-year degree. And my grandmother said, you might as well get the degree. And I didn't know. So I got the bachelor's. Um, and where did you go to? College and nursing school, you get your nurses trained? Yeah, Portland State was my pre-nursing and then the University of Oregon School of Nursing. Okay. And that was in Portland? Yes, okay. it was. Okay. Um, and uh, did you still have a boyfriend? I mean, John, the free throw misser? No. <laughs> <laughs> that did it. No. <laughs> he got a free throw. <laughs> I got real serious about being a nurse, and he was playing baseball, and although that is pretty serious because you can get scholarships, I, I didn't see that big picture at that time. <laughs> Did you all go to the same college? No. no. Did you leave home when you went to school, college? Uh, no, I commuted for my first year, and I lived off campus my last couple of years, but I'd go home a lot because I was right across town. <laughs> I go to church. I taught Sunday school. <laughs> so what did you do when you got out of nursing? School? Well, my minister heard that I wanted to join the Peace Corps. So he got me in contact with the Presbyterian Board of Missions. And if you wanted to be a missionary, you had to have a year's experience after college. Medical, which is really smart. Yeah. You don't want to send a brand new graduate <laughs> over to the jungle medicine. <laughs> so uh, I had my interviews and I was on track 
I, I went to Denver, Colorado for that year of nursing experience. Uh, I, I got to ski at Vail, Colorado all the time. <laughs> <laughs> that was a nice, that was a nice year. I had a nice roommate. We had a little group of people from Oregon that were friends. And so, in, I left, I had missionary orientation in upstate New York and got familiarized with New York City, which is why I moved there later. And then we were off to Vietnam. So in, in July 4th, 1969, I was in Saigon. And there were a group of us who were new. And I have to tell you the, the personnel structure. National Council of Churches sent people, Luther War Relief, sent people and funds, and the Mennonite Central Committee sent people and funds. So it was an ecumenical, an international effort. We had people from other countries. Was Saigon secure at that point? No. The Tet Offensive was 68, I believe. I know, it was. Harry Ziegler was in Saigon in 68, and there was yeah. fighting going on all around them. Yeah. And you could hear gunfire at night. Distant, but you could hear it. Um, were you given a choice for you to serve? Were you given several locations that was just strictly geared towards Vietnam? I was given choices, and Iran was one of the choices. And somehow, I didn't want to be there. <laughs> Probably a good decision. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Being a woman in the 60s in Iran, I probably would have had to wear a burqa. In fact, one of my fellow missionaries subsequently went to Pakistan. She had to work in the lab. She was a lab technologist wearing a burqa. Mm. Can you imagine looking through a microscope? Yeah. So anyway, uh, when you're 23, everything seems, oh, why not? Good. And, and I was sharing with Mickey before. She asked me what motivated me. I, I was a, a Christian, very involved with Campus Crusade in college. And I just felt like I had so, been given so much and my cup was running over. And I was healthy, young, and I just wanted to, to share and possibly give something to somebody else. Can you get a close-up of that? Yeah, yeah. That's right, Dave. But yeah. when, you, when, you, when you get involved in a, pr in a program like I was in, you actually gain a lot more than you give. So. Yeah. That's your ID. Yeah. yeah. That. that picture. Uh -huh. You look like you're is, about 12 years old. Is what, but the expression on my face is like, I can, I'm ready for this. I can do this. Bring it on. Look at that, <laughs> that flip <laughs> she has. Her yeah. Hairdo. Right. <laughs> so, That's um, great. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> We had two months of language training Stayed in, side in Saigon. We had a little bit of linguistics in New York, but then once we were in Saigon, we were in our, our little mother house in Saigon, and all of us trying to learn Vietnamese. It's, it's a lot different than other languages. Each vowel has five tones. So you could be saying the exact right vowel but if your tone doesn't go up like it should, then the Vietnamese look at you. What? What are you saying? They can't. They can't. You know, run through the different tones and say, "Oh, maybe you mean this." No. <laughs> so. Do they? Did any of them speak French? Do many of them in your area speak French? Or they? I met some Carmelite nuns that spoke French. Well, I mean, I mean the natives. No. I, I mean, I mean the the Vietnamese, and because the, the, they've been under the French for a long time. I didn't run into any. Okay. Did you stay at the same place your entire two years? No. After language training, then we went to our assignments. There were about 60 of us in the country at that time. And there were other nonprofit groups that you never heard about. The Quakers were there with uh, prosthetic work and physical therapy. Um, there was a program through the AMA that was a quick, it was like a three-week program. Uh, there were other 
missionary type groups, they never made the headlines, mm -hmm. which maybe is just as well. We didn't do it for headlines. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was assigned to the clinic in Nha Trang. It's a coastal community, and our little hospital was on a bay just north of town. Beautiful location. It's kind of a honeymoon spot. Uh, we had a 50-bed ho general hospital and a 50-bed TB ward. We always had two doctors. One was always a surgeon. We did a lot of um, eye work. People in underdeveloped countries get infections in their eyes, and then their cornea gets scarred. And just the scarring takes your vision out. It's nothing to do with the inside of your eye. It's all external. So there's a surgery where you can scrape that away. And part of a great part of the, the, the work there, which was fashioned after Peace Corps, that model that you train yourself out of a job, you train others, work yourself out of a job. We had a one-year nursing training program and it was like an LVN program. So my, my buddy Martha, who came when I came, was a teacher. Her Vietnamese skills were really good. When so we go you're, you were training Vietnamese? Yes. Okay. yes. And how, how did they adapt to that? Great. They were very nice young women who were, they knew it was a Christian endeavor. And some of them were Christian, some weren't. But just they were the same flock of children from the, for the entire two years, or were there new kids coming out all the time? No, and these were these were like eighteen year olds, the ones in the nursing program. And we had our own little campus. We had our our clinic building, the warehouse. I was in charge of the warehouse. <laughs> <laughs> I. It was hot in the warehouse, <laughs> but I had to do inventory, and we got medication through, through the army, mm -hmm. and I had to do inventory, and this is funny, I was sitting doing inventory, and I had my feet up on a pallet, and this rat ran right <laughs> under my legs, <laughs> under the pallet, and it, I just, the lab was in the same building, and I screamed, <laughs> and Joanne in the lab said, what's going on over there? <laughs> <laughs> I got a rat. <laughs> but later on, I scared the rat. I was walking down the rows, looking at the boxes, and the rat was walking down the aisle. And I just <laughs> got my foot and yelled. And the rat went running away. <laughs> anyway. Uh, and this is very interesting. We got bales of clothing that people collected and sent over to Vietnam through Lutheran, Lutheran World Relief, I believe. And it was funny, because you'd get, I had a patient coming in with this t-shirt that was had a picture of Trigger and, and Roy <laughs> Rogers on it. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. And I would go through these clothes, because some of them were not fit ah. for anybody to wear. Ah. They should have been thrown out, not donated mm. to somebody. So that was part of my job, too, sorting the donations. Did your health hold up while you were over there? Okay. Oh, I had a couple of problems. Uh, I had a funny thing where my throat s was swollen up. My uvula was almost <laughs> translucent. <laughs> And I wasn't sleeping well at night, and I was afraid my throat was going to close up. Was your throat real sore? Yeah. yeah. So I remember going to the clinic at night to get myself a pain pill so I could go to sleep. And we lived in a house through the coconut trees, and I could have been bitten by a snake. We had cobras around. <laughs> and there I was by the moonlight going back to the clinic with my little key. <laughs> <laughs> get my pain pill. And I, actually, our doctor was very worried, and he sent me to Cameron Bay. Uh, we tried not to have a lot of involvement with the military, but they were really, they wanted to help. We took the 
orphans from a, the orphanage next door to the uh, army dentists, mostly for teeth pulling. But Martha and I would fill up the VW bus with orphans and drive them onto the army dentist. <laughs> oh, and the boyfriend from high school was a psych tech at that base in the hospital. I Cameron found out. Bay. No, in the train. On the train. Oh. I'll, I'll get back to the Cameron Bay thing. Thank you. Uh, and I surprised him. I found out that he was there, and I found out what building he was in. <laughs> <laughs> and I walked in the door. Hi, John. <laughs> he, he was quite surprised. Okay. Well, how did he end up there? He was in the army. Oh, he was in the army. Okay, I'm stationed there. Yeah, it was a not a pleasant experience being a psych tech because you had people that were nutty. Oh, I see. That were. Do you have one memory that stands out in your mind? from your missionary duties over in Vietnam? I, I remember a beautiful Easter morning. Uh, we were, our little bay had the World Vision Orphanage, our campus, uh, there was a Christian college, there was a Carmelite convent connected with a a church, a Catholic church, and there was a boys' school. And one Easter morning, got up in the dark and went to Mass. And the nuns were off to the side. Of course, they were, you could never see them. And they would sing the responses to the priest, and it was in French. And it was like the sound of music, the nuns. It was just, gave you goosebumps. It was beautiful. And then when we walked back, the sun was coming up. That was a great experience. The Vietnamese Protestant churches were noisy. There was a lot of fanning going on. <laughs> <laughs> and little kids running around. <laughs> a lot of talking. It sounds like the church I grew up in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So going to the Catholic church was a, just a different experience. Were the services right there in the compound where you were staying? No. It was, they had their own convent. The convent. Yeah. Um, Did it, was there a monsoon season there? Yes. We had a, we lost a roof off of one of our buildings during that time. The rainy season started in September. Oh, I was, go, I'm, I'm going to go back to the Cameron Bay when I got sent there by my, yeah. by my, our doctor. And it was like, you know, we were a family. And he did not like the way my throat looked, and he didn't know what it was. So I went on a helicopter, and an, an army doctor locally in Natrang sent a guy also. So there were the two of us going to see medical people in Cameron Bay. And the fellow going with me was Vietnamese, and he had an artificial eye made out of glass. But it didn't quite fit into the socket. So the army doctor was sending him to the dentist at Cameron Bay because the dentist <laughs> had <laughs> tools <laughs> to shape the eyeball. <laughs> I think it was glass. It might have been plastic. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so what did they find out about your throat? Oh, uh, they didn't know. But it got better. And, and, and I got a horribly bad flu. And it was started out gastrointestinal and ended up respiratory. I lost eight pounds in a matter of a few days. Um, but I do remember we had Vietnamese uh, women that we trained to do our cooking. And, and they just treated me so tenderly and so nicely. And she brought me lemonade what with was sugar. The, what was the food like that you had? Well, some, we had always had sort of American-type breakfasts, but we always had one Vietnamese meal. And right now I can't remember whether it was, I think it was dinner, it was always Vietnamese. And on the weekends we're kind of on our own for food. And, and did you inoculate the, the Vietnamese? I mean, did you just give them shots and things like we do here? Or? Yes, we did have some vaccination clinics and the Vietnamese loved it. They loved injections. 
And this was not a good thing because if your little baby had a cold, the Vietnamese mom would go to the local pharmacy and buy a vial of penicillin and then go to the nurse who had a sign out on the street and the nurse would give the baby penicillin mm -hmm. for just anything. And we even had people coming into the clinic with IVs already started. They loved IV fluids and needles. So when we had a vaccination clinic, it was a, a hit. <laughs> but my job in the clinic was seeing a hun about 100 patients a day. And this other Vietnamese nurse and I were at the table screening. The people would have to buy a number for like two cents out front and wait their turn. And the Vietnamese personal space is real close. So they were right up in your face <laughs> telling you <laughs> what was going on. And I learned enough Vietnamese to get a general idea. Where do you hurt? What's wrong? And, and my, my cohort, the Vietnamese nurse, was right across, and she was one of our graduates, was right across the table if it got too involved. And our job was to screen. What could we treat and what needed to see the doctor? So there are a lot of people waiting to see the doctor. Um, how many doctors did you have? There? Two. And how, so many, just, how many nurses? Uh, well, there were about uh, probably a dozen Vietnamese nurses and about six of the foreign staff. And how many army personnel in that area, in the train? Uh, there was a big base, Camp McDermott, oh. and we weren't that close to it. It was a, a river and a bridge away. But um, your friend John, was, was he at that base? Yes, he was. Oh. And he'd, he'd come out and use our beach, bring some buddies out, um, just because it was away from the camp. Yeah. But they felt very nervous doing that. I don't blame them. And then we had a Korean camp down the way. Um, when, when we heard there were some wonderful missionaries, the Wycliffe Bible translators were near us. They write down these native languages for the first time. There are 116 tribal languages in Vietnam. All the hills have the tribal people. And they're so isolated from each other because of the terrain that they all have their own languages. I got to go up country out of Da Nang with Jackie, missionary, and her tribe was the Kua, C-U-A. And it's a small little group of people, and she was the only non-Kua who spoke their language, and they loved her. They teased her like a daughter. When are you gonna get married, Jackie? <laughs> you have a boyfriend? I didn't understand any of this, but she was interpreting for and it was near a, a little outpost that had just been uh, mortared, had mortar shells fired in that morning. Uh, we went in by helicopter. It was a great trip. And we came back with the helicopter. We, we made another stop on the way back, and the helicopter filled up with orphans <laughs> that this doctor, I don't know who he was connected with, but he had found. So here we were, crowded in the helicopter. I had an orphan on my lap. Jackie had one on her. We were just all crammed in. And these kids were, their eyes were like saucers. <laughs> they were going in a helicopter ride and the doors were open. <laughs> they didn't have doors on them. Uh, I got, a, I was gripped tightly for that trip. Back to did you start your watercolor painting when you were in Vietnam? Yes. I had classes, extracurricular class when I was in college, so I painted in Vietnam. I have about two dozen watercolor oh, yeah? paintings. Oh, maybe we can take a photograph of a couple of them and put okay. in here. They're not here. they're not great art, but they are great Is it memories. Of the scenery. Scenery more and, more and some still life and yeah. Did you do any of the kids and any people there? Did you do any no. real people? I don't really do people. Yeah. So why don't you talk about your exhibition that you had this past Thursday on El Paseo? Well, well, we'll get to that. Yeah. We'll get to that. Mickey's like my oh, mom. She's my best <laughs> fan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll, yeah. We're just about, I'm yes. going to have to change tape okay. here in just a minute anyway. Um, um, so, 
you said there wasn't a lot of action, military speaking, around your area, but right. I, did you, could you hear any shooting going on well, and stuff like that? this is very interesting. We had an artillery training camp nearby, and there was usually an American officer, and he was training Vietnamese. So we had artillery going. Uh, we wouldn't know if we were under attack, because these artillery guns were firing into a, a hill along the beach. Um, and at night, you go out to the bay, beautiful, and the, you can see the tracer bullets. They practice at night, too. Mm -hmm. By the way, uh, to get there from Saigon, did you go by truck, or did they helicopter you up, or how did you get there? We'd fly. Did, was there a There a was base? a train. It took a long time. By flying in a helicopter or no. a C-47 or something like that? Um, we did some military transport. We also flew Air Vietnam. But, but where did you fly into? Where did they have? Was there, there an Air Force base it, up there too? Well, there was an airport at Cam McDermott. Oh. And it was a civilian airport too. I see. I don't know how they shared it exactly, but Air Vietnam was. Did you see many military planes flying over your area? That you No. <laughs> We're too distracted by the artillery. Well, yeah. yeah but Gunfire. Um, <laughs> This is very interesting. The Korean camp was on the way to a uh, refugee camp. And these, these Bible translator missionaries told us that babies were dying in this refugee camp. Mm -hmm. So since I was the clinic nurse, I got a group of us and took some medicine and uh, medical supplies. First, we had to clear doing it, going on a mobile clinic. And we cleared it with the, the USAID people, USAID, uh, who were kind of quasi-military. And then we had to clear it with the Koreans because we needed to cut through their camp. It's shaved off a lot of time. <laughs> and we found that if I was driving or Martha was driving, we got through really well, the Korean camp after we got the paper. You hardly needed the paper if either one of us were driving. If the doctor was driving, the paper was much more important. Were you they thought we were cute. Yeah, well, I, was just, I was just gonna say I would imagine. <laughs> so, um, I think I'm gonna, let's take a break here. I gotta change tapes. Okay, you doing okay? Oh, you yeah. Drink of water or something? Oh. I'm going to, I got some stuff to do out there. Okay, let me put this over here. I'll just put one. I wanted to um, get across. Okay, well, I'm waiting. Okay, I'm going to let you take over here now. Okay. Okay, and so finish up what she's talking about in Vietnam and how you went back home, okay, and what you've done since then up until the present time. And I, you might want to throw in a little bit about what your dad's doing now, uh, any activity. Did he have, like, to play tennis or golf, or did he have things that he'd like to do, uh, hobbies and stuff like that, <laughs> if, he, if, he can, if he did, yeah. if not, you know, maybe, or if he'd like to read or you know, whatever, you know. I'm going to let this run for just a little bit here first because... How will I know when the, when the tape is running out? Uh, it'll, <laughs> it'll, it'll go down, it'll show down here, it'll be a little red, five, four, three, two, one, but okay. it's another 90 minutes, okay. so... We won't talk that long, will we? You never know. <laughs> Me and Harvey Levine. I would like to know when, when you were okay. in, yeah, in you, you uh, Vietnam. Okay, let's, yeah, go ahead. And, and when, when you were engaging with some of the local people, was the Vietnam War ever talked about? My language skills weren't good enough to talk about politics, to be honest. Um, and we avoided the subject. We tried to avoid military uh, on our hospital campus, but we couldn't stop it. Mm -hmm. The a helicopter flew in with Santa, and they brought gifts to our patients and to the orphanage next door. They landed on our lawn. Uh, and then, like I was saying before, the Army dentists really wanted to help out. They wanted to 
help these kids. So they do dental work with the kids. Um, but back to our mobile clinic in the refugee yes. village. These were molten yard people, the mountain people. And they were very poorly treated by the Viet Cong. They were used as slave labor by them. So they had a, a refugee camp and there were uh, cinder block buildings with dirt floors. And the water that they had to use was awful. It was like mud. They didn't have decent wells. So the camp near where you were. No, we had to drive through the Korean camp. It was it was like forty five minute drive uh. away from us. Um, and actually, we saw we saw our jets strafing the hills one time when we were driving to the camp. We, we went every week for a few weeks, and we, we, were, we didn't find any babies that were particularly deathly sick. Nobody was real well because the water wasn't very good. But we'd take patients back then to our little hospital and bring them back when they were better. They didn't want to go. A lot of them didn't know Vietnamese very well. They were mountain people. They had their own language. So it was hard to talk to them. But that was, that was an adventuresome experience. And we had a building where the patients would come. And we'd actually go house to house looking and seeing, how are you, how are you doing, and kind of looking at the kids and the adults to see if they were looking really sick. Uh, how many people would you guess were in the refugee camp? That's a good question. Maybe a couple hundred. Really? Or less. It's hard to say. Um, but what I wanted to share is what wonderful people I got to meet and work with. The, the Mennonite Central Committee utilized young men who were conscientious objectors. Now, they were a, a sanctioned organization that you could do your alternate service through the Mennonites. So our males that were in our program were conscientious objectors for the most part, not all of them, but for the most part they were. They served for three years. They were given $25 a month. So they walked the walk. They were Christian people. They didn't believe in carrying a gun. And they served. They did beautiful work. Some of the most gifted language, uh, Vietnamese language volunteers, with the best command of Vietnamese, were these farm boys from the Midwest mm -hmm. or Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. They learned Vietnamese really well. And they, they wanted to live out in small communities and uh, live off the economy, you know, eat Vietnamese food all the time, which they did. And when they got hepatitis, they'd come and stay with us in our hospital. Because we had cooks that were boiling the water and you know our food was very safe. So we'd get to know them when they were recovering from hepatitis. Was there a lot of hepatitis uh, over yeah. in the camp? As, as in a lot of underdeveloped countries, when you're a child, you might have a case of hepatitis that's mild, so you have an immunity. Uh, we don't have an immunity, so we are very easily get hepatitis. And we all know this traveling to certain countries, you have to watch what you eat. Uh, the uh, back to these other volunteers one of our Mennonites was killed by the Viet Cong in his own home while I was there he the Viet Cong came into his home and he was doing some kind of agricultural work or social work I can't remember 
And at gunpoint, they said, give us your money. And he said, in fluent Vietnamese, I don't have any money. I'm here doing this. And he explained what he was doing. And he had a, a, a little wife. She was a real petite little woman from, uh, I think she was from Taiwan. And he had just married her. She was a volunteer, too. Well, they said, you're American. Of course you have money. And of course he denied it, and they shot him. They killed him. The women were hiding in, the, in a protected area in the house, and one of the Viet Cong came over and said, just stay there. So they stayed there all night long, or for hours, I don't know, and came out later. And then one of our other volunteers was shot because she was foolish. She was out after curfew on the back of a motorcycle with an American soldier. And they'd have civil patrols at night. You're not supposed to be on the road. There's a curfew every single night. And she thought she was above rules, so she was killed. So while I, in my two years, two of our volunteers were killed. Do you think a lot of the violence there was, was driven and manifested because of the war? Or do you think it was because poverty was, was like so prevalent there? Um, no, the, the violence was related to a lot of people having guns uh, that didn't have guns before. The poverty drove a lot of theft. Our, one of our vehicles was stolen one time, and two of our, our volunteers got in another vehicle and, and went the way that this truck went. And there were roadblocks at night. You couldn't just drive around a country road at night. You'd have to stop and show your identification. So our stolen vehicle was stopped at a roadblock. Mm. And our, our uh, two volunteers uh, were able to see that the thieves were sleeping in the, in the vehicle. And they were able to go over there, and the thieves ran away. So they got the So the curfew back. was was in the facility where you lived? It, or was, it was all over the country. All over. Yeah. And then we, our house was robbed. Martha and I lived in this little duplex and a Vietnamese family on the other side, near, near the hospital grounds, right on the campus. And I woke in the night one night and I looked over. We had mosquito nets around our beds. And I looked over and I saw somebody walking by. And I thought it was my housemate, Martha. So I said, Martha, Martha, and it was the thief. He was making off with a fan that he'd got in her room. He had to reach around her bed to get this fan. And then I screamed, um, and he ran away. And they left part of the stuff that they took. Was that the only instant of violence in the, uh, in the camp or the, the facility where you were yeah. living? Yeah. that was. That was scary, though. Um, and another thing that was really funny was Martha and I had a mouse. And it was, well, I opened a drawer in the dresser. Or we saw the mouse, and it ran away, ran behind the dresser. I opened the drawer, and the mouse jumped out of the door right at me. And so I screamed. And the Vietnamese neighbors came over. This mouse had wings. It was just flying all around the room. It was going up our mosquito nets, down on the dressers, down on the floor, running behind things. And the little grandma, Vietnamese lady, had a broom. We all had something. <laughs> we were going to get this mouse. And it was the Vietnamese grandma that nailed the mouse. That was it. She got it. So did you ever have have a feeling that uh, that the food that did that that, you, that was available to you that it was there was a rationing or that 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 the the money situation was very low I mean did, did, did the money ever impact the way you were fed and the way you were taken care of or the lack no, of it no, no. We, we were mm -hmm. very nicely nourished um, once a week, our cooks were taken to the market, 
and we had refrigeration. We mm. had refrigerators, kerosene driven motors. And they'd bring back all sorts of really nice vegetables and fruits. We had papaya trees near nearby us and uh, no, we were very nicely fed. We were my salary was three hundred and fifty dollars a month and fifty dollars or so, I can't remember exactly, went towards my boarding room. So it helped pay for foods. What was there to spend your money on? Well, there was Vietnamese, um, there was cloth, real pretty cloth. I had a national costume made for me called an Aoyai. And it's two parts. It's pants made out of a silky material and then a, a top that had split on mm. the hips. So there was a front panel and a back panel and it had a real nice flow to it. Very pretty, usually long sleeve sometimes high collar, sometimes a little lower. Um, and there were handicrafts. And I bought a beautiful doll that was made by the Carmelite nuns. We heard that they made dolls. So Martha and I went over and you don't look at the nun. There's a door with a little uh, screen and you talk to them. And they spoke French and Vietnamese, and our Vietnamese, of course, was okay. But that is a real treasure that I have, that I bought, is my Vietnamese doll. And Were you sad when you knew that your tour was up and it was time to leave and come home? I had mixed feelings. Um, I knew that I wanted to get on with my career in nursing and I was interested in living in New York City so I was getting job offers in the mail. I made a couple of inquiries and I was just flooded with these job offers. I guess they were desperate. Well they were in New mm -hmm. York City. Mm -hmm. But the idea of living in New York City was exciting to me. That was my plan. I was moving to New York City. So how was the, the mail situation when you were there from home? Okay, this was interesting. We got mail privileges through the Army. So we had APO addresses. Oh. Mm -hmm. And one of us would go pick up mail for our group on a regular basis. Um, and one of my projects really was helped out by the mail. Our TB hospital had 50 beds, all these little beds in one room with the mosquito nets over them. And these were people that really needed more care. They needed regular medication, maybe some injections on a daily basis. And they had a resistant TB over there. Mm -hmm. So they would come and their, their families would cook for them. So they'd eat better than they were eating previously. And they were bored. So I thought, I want to do a project. Uh, one of my little crafty projects when I was a little girl was making artificial flowers. And you can make it out of crepe paper. Is this your phone? It was me. So. I'm going to go. Oh, OK. OK. I'll see you guys later. OK. The lady um, that was going to email you the pictures to put on her, yes. I ha have you received those yet? Okay, okay, thank you. Okay. We're almost done. Yeah, I'll just get all that stuff. So one of my projects was, I'm going to ask my church if they can send me crepe paper. We could get manila envelopes. It had to be pretty flat. But you could cut crepe paper and, you know, to fit the pack of the manila envelope, big manila envelope, which they did. So I got a lot of crepe paper and we used sticks. We didn't have wire. And we could get glue. So I took my little supplies and went over to the TB ward one Saturday. I, I didn't work in the clinic was not open on Saturday and Sunday. So I sat down and I, I had made some flowers to show them how, what you could do. Well, they 
went wild oh. with creativity. And every time I went over there, somebody had invented a new flower. Uh. And the whole place was beautiful with these branches of flowers and flowers stuck in little vases and stuck uh. to their, their mosquito nets. So that's what I mean about you gain so much more than you could ever give. Mm -hmm. um, and another time, and, and then the Chinese New Year, the Lunar New Year, that ward was very well decorated, had a lot of flowers. Um, another time I thought, I know how to embroider, so I'll do some embroidery. And my church sent me embroidery thread, <laughs> and you could buy cloth, but they sent me needles and embroidery thread. Mm, scissors, probably, I don't know, we had scissors. So I took my supplies over there and sat down, and you know, it was very, it was very intimate. We just sat on the little beds, and. Everybody gathered around, and by that time I was used to their personal space, <laughs> close. <laughs> and I just showed him an example and a few little stitches. Well, they did beautiful work. And there was one man who was a patient who had been a tailor. He was a beautiful artist with embroidery. And he embroidered a beautiful piece that he gave to me that had my name on it. He asked me how to spell my name. So, mm -hmm. uh, once again, I, I thought I could help out here and then they just came back with mm -hmm. so much more. Um, I did the same thing. I made a trip in 2000 back to Vietnam with a group called Peacework and I took supplies to make flowers. The hospital that had been our Christian hospital was now a government hospital and it was a rehab hospital, so I knew that people were there with mm. nothing to do, probably. So we made flowers. Mm. That was great. Mm. It was really nice. Mm. Um, what do you? What's the flight like going into Vietnam from the states? Um, did you go to Hawaii? Did you go leave from the East Coast? Did you leave when I went over there, we went to Alaska, and then to Hong Kong. And we spent a little while in Hong Kong, and then maybe Taiwan, and maybe Vietnam. On other, on the, that other trip, we went out of L.A., I think, to Taiwan, to Vietnam. So it was a long flight. Yeah, hours and hours. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So to, to sum up my Vietnamese experience, I, I was very, I felt very enriched by the experience, and that I had gained much more than I had been able to contribute. Um, wonderful friends who had their priorities straight, very good people. I was probably too young. If I were there now, I'd be more effective, I think. What happened to Martha, your friend? You, Martha that. went back to North Carolina. She got advanced degrees in nursing. She taught nursing, and she's retired now. So, what? So you kept and in she, contact? Yeah, yeah. And she was married. She is married. So, and then one of the doctors who was a career missionary has since he and his wife both have died since. Uh. They were in their 50s or 60s when they were in Vietnam. So. But I, I, I lived in, and worked in New York City after Vietnam. I worked at New York University Hospital. I met my husband there. Uh, a, mutual, a friend that I met skiing introduced us. Um, what month was this when you went back to New York? It was in like February of 72. I stayed home just to kind of rest up a little bit for a few months with my family after mm -hmm. I got back from Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So um, I was in, v in New York in 72 and we were married in 74 and then he had a, he was going to school in New Jersey so we lived in Morristown, New Jersey 
and then he decided he wanted to be in the ministry. So he... How far away is it from New Jersey to your job? Well, I worked in New Jersey. Oh, you worked in New Jersey. Yes. Okay. And had, had several jobs in New Jersey. And you got married in New Jersey? No. In his home in Brooklyn. His mom wasn't feeling well, so we were married in his home. I was very active in uh, church, in Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church. Um, you didn't meet your husband in church, though? Uh, no. Through a friend? Yeah. yeah. So we were in New Jersey for a couple of years, and then he became an intern there. And we lived in a church in the upstairs. That was interesting. Beautiful building. Mm -hmm. And then he had to go to St. Paul, so I, we were in Minnesota for a while. I worked there. And then his first job was in uh, Staten Island, New York. So we were back to New York. And Where is that uh, in relation to Manhattan? Just south. You go right past the Statue of Liberty and you come to Staten Island. Oh. Yeah. You know, the Verrazano Bridge is a bridge between Brooklyn and Staten Island. So it, it borders the harbor of New York. And there I worked as a nursing and clinical instructor and we had both of our, our boys there, Phil and Josh. And did, did you rent or did you have a, have a house? Yeah, or? well, it was the parsonage. Oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then he got a job in singles ministry, which was the greatest effort. It was great in Longview, Washington. So we were out there. And then we were in Vancouver, Washington. And that's where I did my longest job. I was a hospice nurse for about 13 years. That your family was happy to have you come back, huh? Oh yeah, that was great, mm -hmm. really great. So. Now were you the first one married or did your older sister? Older sister first, then my younger sister. I your was younger the last. sister got married before you did? Yeah, I yeah. was the last. Okay. And what did what did Linda do? I know your your older sister Patty is a school teacher, right? Was a school teacher. Yes, and Linda was a school teacher also. She also flew for United Airlines. And did you were you did you participate in their weddings? In my younger sisters, yes. My older sisters was real small. So. So. Uh, how far away, uh, when you moved back to Washington State, how far away was that from the family home? Really close. It, Portland, um, probably about 25 miles, 20, 25 miles. Mm -hmm. Now, when you, when you were in New York, your husband's family were from, lived in New York also? Yes, they were Norwegian immigrants to America in the 20s. So my husband learned English in first grade, and he's still fluent in Norwegian. And they, both his parents have since uh, died. His mom and dad came and lived with us when we were in Longview, and we took care of them. That was a good experience to have, mm -hmm. to have them taken care of mm -hmm. and not be in Brooklyn mm -hmm. in a kind of a not too safe neighborhood and just vulnerable as older people. Now, where did you have your first son, Philip? Back east or? Yeah, or that was in Staten Island. Staten Island. Yeah, mm -hmm. in 78. And then Josh also was born in Staten Island. Do, did you continue working uh, after you had your children? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. It was part time. I've always worked at least part time. Mm -hmm. So until June thirtieth, two thousand eleven, <laughs> when I retired. <laughs> now, who who had children? Who had grandchildren first for your mom and dad? Oh, my older sister. The older sister. Yeah. And then. Than me, than my younger sister, I think. 
my younger sister and her children and mine are roughly the same ages, so it was close. Were your parents active in the grandchildren's lives? Yes. Mm -hmm. We had some great visits back and forth. And okay, so, so your dad came home and he went to work, got a job, and the children were raised up, went to school and college. Yeah, and my mom was a stay-at-home mom until we were about college age. Um, she and my dad danced, ballroom danced. That was the greatest thing they did together, and they did it for decades. They'd take lessons and then belong to different groups that met at country clubs or some, and then the Elks Club would have dancing, and there my mom and dad would be. They knew a lot of different steps. So that was a big part of their lives. Yes, mm -hmm. it was. And they liked to travel. Um, my dad tried golf, but didn't stick with it. He hunted a little bit, but not much. Um, How old was your dad when he retired? He was in his 70s. 70s. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he's still living in that same house? Yes, he is. Mm -hmm. Five bedrooms. Yeah. Okay. So then let's talk a little bit about your two boys. Philip is the oldest. And he is in where? He's in Boise, Idaho. He's married. And he's a respiratory therapist. And how many children? And they have two little girls. A two-year-old and a six-month-old. Five or six months now. And uh, Jenna Lee is our daughter-in-law. She's a dental hygienist working part-time. They stagger their hours, so they take care of the kids themselves. And our other son is Joshua. He is going to school in Norway. He was in the Air Force for six years. He has a degree from you know, in Indiana University, and he's going for a master's in business in Norway. And it seems to be working out. Do you think he, he went back to pursue his master's degree in Norway because of his ancestry? Could be. It's really nice. He's met a relative who is going to school in the same school. So, and it, it, his relative's name is the same name as his dad's name. Two burnts. Burnt his so your dad has a fairly, your husband has a fairly common uh, Norwegian name then? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And uh, Josh is in Norway now, and when does he expect to get his uh, master's? It's going to be about a year and a half from now. So. And he's excited being there? Yes. He's learning to fish. <laughs> he keeps sending pictures of fish that he's caught. <laughs> but he's he's in a good program too. Okay, so now let's let's talk about your, your two sisters and tell me where they're living. Oh, okay. My younger sister Linda is in Colorado, near Denver. Um, and she's married. Her husband is a retired orthopedic surgeon and she has had they have three children. One grandchild. My older sister is in Portland. She has two daughters and three grandchildren. And both of my sisters are, all three of us have long time marriages, which is very positive. It's good. And your dad uh, is doing what these days? My dad is a little limited by his mobility, but he he's spending more time at home. He has a lady friend, and they used to go dancing regularly, but they're not doing that anymore. Her heart and his legs makes it a problem. Um, he. I don't think he's 
a regular at church, but except for going to a lot of funerals because he's 91. And there's always a new funeral he's going to. He has an RV, but he hasn't driven that in a while. And uh, he's been up on the roof lately, which scares us. <laughs> he's got a 20 foot ladder leaned up against the house. I thought about this earlier. How did you learn so much about your dad's uh, uh, military service? Would it, would it come up like it, uh, at the dinner table when you were growing up? Not really. He would talk about it on car trips. Um, would you take notes? No. But after I started volunteering, volunteering here, I got out a legal pad and asked him specific questions. So I lined up his story uh, and then had him proofread it and correct it. So I, I really got serious about it after being a volunteer here. Was that something that you always wanted to do or was it just kind of was the natural way things happen? I, I wanted to do it maybe for the last eight years or so. And I started to do it and then he took the legal pad away from me and said, I'll finish this. And then he just put it away and never did anything. So I got the legal pad back and finished the job. <laughs> so your dad's living his life and, and he has a lady friend to spend time with. And let's talk about you're, you're, you're in Washington State and how you got to California. Oh, we were on vacation here and um, at the Desert Princess at the hotel, going to play golf, and I was signed up for a, an art workshop at the art museum. And then we came down again, and I brought my resume with me. And just on a lark, I went to the nurse recruiter at Eisenhower and Desert Regional Medical Center, and the recruiter at Desert Regional Medical Center was real interested in pursuing me getting a job. Was your husband so, thinking about retirement at that time? We were thinking about it and didn't know where we would end up. So if I, I got a job here and they paid our moving expenses, so we figured this is a good place to be retired. So, so you came down, or, or you both, he was here, and you looked for a home, and you bought a home. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, how long were you here before he, he retired and came down? It was almost two years, and he was back and forth every couple of months. So, so would you, like, take time off or your vacation and go visit him and then back again? Mm -hmm. Yes, I was back and forth. Too. So, did he pastor a large church? He did. His last church was Centralia, Washington, and he was there about 12, 13 years, and it grew amazingly while he was there. I imagine yeah. he, he cultivated a lot of friendships there. Yes. They really liked him. Well, they liked him so well that he hadn't taken vacation, so they let him come down here every couple of months. Mm -hmm. And they they wanted him so so much that they gave him all that time off. It's good. Was he excited about moving away and down to a desert community? I think so. Yeah, and we really enjoy being down here and having friends from up north come and visit. And it's great. It's a magnet for people from the northwest <laughs> who are sick of the rain. <laughs> so it's fun to see. I think I told you this before. I don't know of anyone that has more friends than you and Vern have. Oh, well. And that, that <laughs> speaks very highly of you two. Well, thanks. Yes. But a lot of them they like us, but they like the sun here too. 
that's all. <laughs> so then, so so now you're working, and, and he's nearing retiring and coming down to California, and you're working full time as a nurse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, how did you wind down your career? Well, I went from full time, which is three twelve hour shifts a week, to two twelve hour shifts a week, um, plus some extra thrown in here and there when they call you. When they call me. So I did that for the last couple of years, and uh, so he came down. And you were still working full time, correct? Yeah. And then after he came down, you went to part time. Uh, yes, yes. And then we had a. I flew up, and was there for his uh, retirement dinner, which was a huge turnout. The whole gymnasium in the church filled up with tables and people. Mm -hmm. It was great. Um, and we got in his tundra, which was packed, a lot of it was books, mm. and drove down. So. And since you've been living in, in the desert, uh, both of your children have been to your home, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And you are uh, looking forward to a life with your two granddaughters. We'll probably be snowbirds. Um, we have a little house in Idaho now. And okay, let's talk about how you came to be a volunteer here at the museum. Oh yeah. Well, I came here to the museum just by myself. It was at a time when I was Bert was here, I guess, but he didn't really want to come with me, so I just came by myself and asked about the B-17. I must have seen in the paper something that they had one. And immediately had a real interest in it. So, so I don't. I don't know if I even went to the whole museum before I thought I needed to be a volunteer. So, so walk me through the process. You came here, and you knew then you wanted to become a volunteer. Yeah, on my first visit. So I just filled out an application and got in a class. It was, they keep changing the training. Uh, it worked out really well for me. And the B-17 was perfect for me. Did you gravitate to the B-17 because of your dad's yes. uh, service in the military? Yeah, mm -hmm. I, did. Mm -hmm. I did. And were, were you fairly certain that you could plan on uh, the same day every week uh, from you. Did you think that would interfere with your nursing? Well, I was given the same day off. I told them at work that I was volunteering and I had to pick a day. So every Monday I was given that day off. I was not scheduled on that day. Very occasionally I was because the need was great at work, but over the course of years Monday was my volunteer day and it was not scheduled at work. That worked out great. So let, let's talk about, so now you're a volunteer, you went to school and now you're a volunteer and you're working on the B-17 and uh, did, did you start making friends at the museum as soon as you took on your volunteerism at the B-17? I think so. And one of my favorites isn't with us anymore, Bob Martin. He was a pilot in World War II. He got the Distinguished Flying Cross. He flew out of Italy. and Just a great man, really nice man too. And you've done a lot of extracurricular volunteering also. Haven't you been down to the, as a volunteer at the Jackie Cochran uh, yeah, airport? Yeah, I went there once and I went to uh, the air, when it was in uh, Beaumont, I went to an air show there and volunteered. I volunteered a few times at the street fair, <laughs> and it's really cold in November, let me tell you. And, and the street fair was promoting the museum. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And 
didn't you have your son Josh and he go with you a lot of the time as well? He did. He helped out. I was very grateful. And now I'm getting involved in the ambassador program. Okay, so let's get into your 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 uh, painting career. So how did you first become interested and how did you become a painter? Well, I was as a kid I would do the painting that kids do. And then I started doing a little still life when I was in college. Then I enrolled in a class in college, which was just not, not at all involved with the school, but the teacher used one of the classrooms. It was a pathology lab with these black slate tables and Bunsen burners. Um, and that really got me interested in knowing more about design and color and using watercolor correctly. So you've always been been able to draw and to work with colors and and you have um, all the time that you were working you were still painting is that is that yes correct? yeah still painting there were some periods when I was doing beading or stained glass and not painting but since coming to the desert I got more and more involved with a wonderful teacher and. Um, belonging to the Watercolor Society, and now I belong to the Desert Art Center and the Art Museum Artist Council. So I've been in shows and starting to sell some things and um, doing it more as a business. And what was the subject of, of your, your first watercolors? Did you, did you have a particular subject that you, like, did you paint buildings, did you paint flowers, or? You know, I love the Victorian houses in Portland, Oregon. So that was my first love. I'd take pictures of them and go back and draw and paint the picture. And I still love doing Victorian homes. I, I love doing um, details of elaborate windows, light fixtures, like street light fixtures, old buildings. But I'm painting other subjects too. Okay, and uh, you, you have uh, exhibited in a lot of locations out in the desert, have you not? Well, a few. Right now I'm the Artist of the Month at the uh, Fast Frame in Rancho Mirage. I have about 25 works, pieces there. And I have a koi fish at Dwight Poland Antique, Chinese Antique Store on El Paseo. So things are moving along. I'm trying to get a website going. <laughs> I forgot to mention your retirement party when, when you retired from nursing and you were looking around for places to have it and you settled on the museum. Let's talk about that. Well, I was very fortunate. I wanted to have it at the museum in the B-17 hangar and because I volunteer here, um, they graciously gave me a discount on the rental so I could afford to do it. And did I you not? You planned every aspect of your party, did you not? I did. My theme was uh, spreading my wings, so I had a butterfly theme. And I invited people from work. My family came, my sisters and their husbands. Uh, our son Josh was here at that time. And as a surprise, my sisters brought my dad. And it was a total shock. He said he'd never get on an airplane again. But with my sister at his side, he managed to come. You were very surprised, right? Yeah. Real surprised. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So at the party, he got to sit under the wing of the B-17. And I think you had quite a it. few people at, at, at your party, and it seemed like it was very well received. I know I had it. I, it was my pleasure to be there. I had a very good time. 
and your husband oh and you also set up a studio down in the B17 yes I displayed my artwork and actually two people bought paintings as a result I didn't expect that I was just going to show it just to demonstrate and, what I was going to do in retirement <laughs> and you had gotten into painting koi fish what right. uh, sometime before your retirement party mm -hmm. and tell us how you first got acquainted with the, the koi fish well I took some pictures when we were in Hawaii of some koi fish in a pond in our hotel and I just was looking at these pictures and decided I'd try to paint the fish and th this they are funny looking pictures I'll tell you my paintings will look funny and then I heard about a woman in the area here who had her her, her koi pond and she let me photograph her fish and she and her husband subsequently bought a painting that I did with their fish in it <laughs> and he happens to be the board of directors president of the art museum so that was very encouraging for me so I like painting the fish I like painting other things too I've seen some of your pictures and they're they're beautiful they're beautiful and they really your pictures really fit in with the antique dealership down on oh, yeah. El Paseo. Yeah. They fit perfectly in there. And I know that you've exhibited at the at the Indio Indio County Fair. Yeah. Uh, you've had your paintings at the Palm Springs. The Art Museum. Art Museum. Yeah. And you you are a member in the Palm Springs Art Museum, are you not? Yes. And every year our watercolor society has a show and I've been in that show too. And uh, at the at the community where you live, uh, have you been able to sell any of your paintings there? Oh yeah, Mickey, you're pretty good at reminding me. I have three of three of my prints of, of flowers in our boardroom that was purchased by our homeowners association. So obviously, they they saw something. In your paintings that they liked yes because did you not you had sold them two to begin with and then they came back for a third one correct right. yes okay I had to complete the arrangement on the wall and then uh, while you were getting uh, some of your completed paintings framed you met a lady that works in a frame shop is that correct let's right. let's talk about that yes I was a customer I am a customer of fast frame in Rancho and throughout the season, they have an artist every month showing their work. So, Cat uh, is her name. Asked me last year, and she asked me again this year to be the artist of the month. So I'm doing it. But you, you had it. Uh, you had hung several of your paintings in her shop, and they were there for what a month. Yes. They're, and they're there right now, too. And you have another event in the future. Let's hear about oh, that one. Um, I've been accepted into Art Under the Umbrellas in La Quinta in February and March. I'm going to be there three Saturdays with my booth. <laughs> so. Is there uh, anything that you can think of that we have not touched upon. Uh, I think there is. I think you're you are going to be making a major move, and you're going to become a snowboarder. Yeah. Well, we already touched a little. I we have a home, a little house in Boise, so we'll be back and forth. Hard to give up the sunshine here. But but you you'll revisit it every year. Yeah. And uh, you, you also got heavily involved and designed your own website one time. Yes, and I'm trying to do it again. We'll see how that works out. Mm -hmm. 
You're pursuing options for another website, aren't yes. you? Yes. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And do, do you enjoy uh, doing this on the computer? Uh, I have to do it. I don't really enjoy it. The instruction manual is 24 pages long that I printed off of my printer. So we'll see. But you've also gotten engaged with Facebook. I love to keep track of my former co-workers and see what they're doing and see what my son is doing in Norway. It's really nice. And my family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's really nice. And you've created a catalog of your, of your paintings that when you do exhibit your paintings, you can lay the catalog out for people to see yeah. some of your work. Mm -hmm. Now it's just a matter of selling them. <laughs> And you have an event coming up uh, later on in November. Let's talk about that at the frame shop. Isn't it the 18th of November? Well, that's the reception. And it's for a couple of hours on Friday the 18th from 6 to 8. But my paintings are there now. So anybody can pop in at any time and see them. And when you move away, you're still going to continue volunteering at the museum when oh, you yeah. come back as a snowbird. Oh, yeah. And um, at, the, at the museum, you, were, you also participated in a couple of chili cook-offs, didn't you? Yes. And it was a lot more enjoyable when I wasn't doing it all by myself <laughs> for the B-17 group. We had a nice time this year. There were five of us making chili sold out by 1 or 1.30. It was a nice effort. It was really good. Is this your third time uh, being in the chili cook-off? No, my second. I had to take a rest after the first year. But I'm back. <laughs> and all you have to do is ask people to make chili. <laughs> and they do it. And then you're not doing it by yourself. It's nice. But we had a great table the first year with the chili theme. That was colorful and good. We'll have to get back on that. And dress up. You were thinking at one time of, of buying a brick for your dad. Are you still thinking about doing that? I have a brick for my dad. It's already in place. Out in front of the museum. Wow. Behind the statue of the Navy Flyer. It's right under his backpack, his uh, parachute. So, oh, really? Yeah. We'll have to take a picture of that and maybe add it on to, to the end of this, oh. this uh, okay. DVD. Yeah. I'll have to find out if we can do that. I'm not sure that we can, okay. but that would be a, a nice uh, page to insert in, your, mm -hmm. in the transcription. Yeah. yeah. Well, Sue, we thank you so very much for All coming right. over. I think we've covered my life and my dad's life pretty well. And uh, hopefully your dad will warm up to this at some time in his life. Yeah. And uh, you have a knack of catching him at his good moments. So uh, mm -hmm. perhaps when you're up there and when you get together for Christmas or Thanksgiving or whatever, maybe you can yeah. play the DVD and the rest of your family can see it. Right. I will. Yeah. Thanks okay. for letting me yeah. tell okay. my stories. Well, Sue, we thank you so much, and this is going to be uh, submitted to the Veterans History Project at the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., and uh, it's, it's a wonderful program for veterans and people who have uh, somehow uh, made their dent in history, and yours is going to Vietnam and become a missionary after the Vietnam War. and. Uh, at some point, we're hopeful that perhaps your DVD and others who have volunteered will be available through the website so that your children and their children can go to the internet and somehow click on it and be able to view it. That's a wonderful thing. Yeah. yeah. And you, uh, this is your volunteer day. Yes. So after you leave here, you're I'm going... Late. You're going down to volunteer on the B-17, yeah? yeah. Okay, great. Sue, so thank you so much for coming, Thanks, Matt. Okay.
Okay. Bye-bye. Gosh, look what time it is. It's one